Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Fangda Partners in which we will discuss the key legal issues relating to the opening up of China's financial sector, especially those in the investment management and fintech industries. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a wonderful panel to take us through today's discussion. But before I hand you over to begin today's webinar, a quick housekeeping item. You can submit questions to today's panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, but please do reach out after the webinar for any additional information you may require. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Z and Blake to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for the Mandak for the um, opportunity for the presentation. Um, um, and um, and as, as you know, this year, 2023, um, actually uh, is the first post-COVID year. Uh, and um, it is uh, well um, widely expected and uh, um, you know there will be solid economic growth uh, in 2023 this year in china and also we anticipate the uh, financial sector will both assist and benefit from such growth um, first of all we expect the use of fintech um, such as like big data ai and other technologies to support uh, innovation in the financial sector um, for example, in the field of insurance, um, like um, you know, transforming the core business system of insurance with the um, Internet of Things architecture. Um, secondly, for investment in the financial market, uh, we will also continue to open, expand, and diversify. And the regulatory approval for market access to the sector will also accelerate. And certainly, there will be various laws and regulatory rules uh, in the financial area are likely to be issued and revised uh, this year as well. Um, so um, there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, movements uh, in the financial sector in China. Uh, and hopefully, um, um, we can uh, really share our insight with you um, for uh, to so that uh, you can uh, grab the opportunity. So I will hand over to Blake uh, to um, go into the uh, presentation slides. Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is Blake Wong from Fonda Partners. Uh, many thanks to everyone for joining us for this webinar. Also thanks to Dan and Aaron for their excellent job for organizing this webinar. Here we have a actually quite big topic here. It's opening up for China's financial sector, uh, but we will focus on the investment management and the fintech industries. Uh, and also as lawyers who have been advising many foreign uh, reputable asset managers on their entering the PRC market, our perspective will be primarily from how the how people can uh, exploit opportunities in this huge market. But uh, we will share our perspective based on practices, which we are, rather than merely a summary of the regulatory framework. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so we see the table contents here. We will, uh, we will have primarily five parts in, during this webinar. First, we will briefly introduce the regular framework. It might not be too different from any regular framework you see in, in the, on the market, but we will uh, share our perspective primarily from recent uh, practices. Secondly, we will talk about uh, all the, uh, we will briefly talk about all the licenses, products, and uh, types of investors people can raise funds from so that you can have a systematic understanding of how to enter the Chinese market, which licenses to apply for, and which product to issue, and uh, which investor you have access to. 
and the third part will be the fintech regulation, which we'll briefly introduce. And the fourth part, the fourth part will be certain ongoing concerns that the asset managers in China should be concerned about, and also the regulatory trends. At last, we'll briefly talk about uh, Fonda introduction introduction to our practice. Okay, and the next slide. But for the next slide, we will talk about uh, uh, the regulatory framework. Okay, and uh, the next one, next slide will be will, uh, the the regulatory framework in China. Uh, first of all, we know on the top of the framework we have the state council here, but uh, the features of the PRC regulatory framework, especially in the financial industry, is that uh, we have uh, primarily two lines of regulatory bodies. First, under the state council on the left side, we see that they, we have the financial stability and the development committee. And under it, the specific financial regulators, including PBOC, CBIRC, CSRC. Uh, they stand for PBOC, the central bank. CBRC is the banking and the insurance regulator. And CSRC will be the security regulator. So each of them is in charge of different sectors including banking, insurance, and securities. And uh, each of them may have certain affiliated regulators or uh, set regulatory bodies. For example, under CSRC, we have the AMAC, which is the Asset Management Association of China, in charge of regulating private fund managers. And further, CSRC also supervises uh, various stock exchanges. And on the left side of the framework, we can see that there is the local governments. So the local governments, they also have, uh, uh, under the local government, they also have the local financial offices, which will regulate the daily uh, operations of different uh, types of financial uh, institutions. Okay, so then we can go to the slide six. In slide six, uh, we will talk about, uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, the key opening milestones in recent years. So the opening up of the PRC financial uh, industry has been quite quick in recent years. So it, and uh, because of the quick uh, involvement of this industry, we actually might not able to fo to summarize all the detailed uh, opening up policy uh, on one slide, but we can see all the major breakthroughs since 2019. Actually, before 2019, there are also some major developments. For example, uh, before 2019, in around 2017, the PRC regulator removed the uh, major foreign ownership uh, threshold for various types of financial institutions. But we are mainly interested in the policies since 2019 because, for example, we see here for future companies, security companies, and fund management companies, the government uh, quickly removed the foreign ownership, any foreign ownership cap in 2020. So that's a very quick development over just uh, two or three years. And that's why in recent years, we have seen a, a very quick growing market here. Many international institutions have been approaching us about the how to enter the PRC market, how to apply for all the types of financial licenses. And uh, following their application, they have ongoing concerns how to operate uh, in compliance with PRC laws. Also, uh, another set of these opening up policies is the government has also been 
tightening up their regulation over all the types of financial institutions. So on one hand, we have all the foreign investors enter this market. On the other hand, we have seen uh, a, a, a more complex the regulatory framework uh, regime. So this is a quite a growing, quite quickly growing market here. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of this slide, we can see that uh, for the specific asset management license, for example, QDLP, QDIE, QFLP, uh, the government has been granting new quota and also expanding the pilot areas mm -hmm. where foreign asset managers can apply for the licenses. And that's two. And at the bottom of the slide, we see private security fund managers. There are already 32 foreign PFM movies who can apply for a PFM license, who have a PFM license and can raise funds from local investors. If, if you, you, okay. And for the... My apologies, okay. and can you bring the slide back up? Okay, uh, no problem. We can quickly uh, summarize. So, uh, for the opening up uh, policy in the recent two years, we can see that uh, the, uh, the government has been quickly uh, allowing many foreign asset managers to enter this market. And uh, you may remember that we mentioned uh, uh, there are, for example, future companies, security companies. And fund, okay, thanks, excellent. And we can see that we have fund management companies, security companies, future companies. So, so one question people might be interested in is, which license will allow you to manage assets in China? So for this question, we can uh, discuss in details later, but very briefly, all of these financial regulators financial institution, for example, future companies, secure bank companies, they can become a future broker or security broker. But meanwhile, they can also have an asset management license under which they can issue asset management products. Okay, uh, for the next slide, slide six, they can, uh, in, in, in recent two or three years, Already many foreign asset managers have been allowed to enter the PLC market. Here we can quickly browse these approved cases, for example, secure companies. Well, the big names, for example, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and the Interfund Japan, Wen Nomura from Europe, Credit Suisse, UBS. The, then we have the fund manager companies wealth management uh, license, future companies. Uh, many of these international institutions are our clients. Actually, we will see the majority of them are our clients. We have assisted them on applying for very different types of licenses. And based on these experiences, we have the feeling that uh, uh, still many foreign asset managers are eager to enter this market. Many cases are still ongoing, even with all the disputes and controversies between uh, neighbor, between China and certain other countries, but still in the asset, in the financial sector and uh, for asset managers, we still see many foreign players trying to come into China rather than leaving China. So this is quite different from some certain other industries. Okay, so then we can go to part two. For the next slide, we'll talk about uh, specifically uh, how to, what are the factors people can consider when you apply for license and launch products and approach PLC investors. And uh, for the next slide, first of all, we can briefly have a picture of the landscape of PRC financial licenses. 
still there are many licenses. So this is why we have been advising our clients how to navigate the the huge market here, uh, which license they can consider. For example, some clients might ask us about uh, in the in the middle of this slide, we can see under CBR IRC, which is the banking insurance regulator. And the CBR, I see they can grant uh, licenses, for example, bank wealth management license. But uh, when a client approaches us, they might not be int only interested in bank wealth management license because with the bank license, wealth management license, they might actually also cooperate with, for example, uh, private uh, fund manager, uh, which is on the right bottom of this slide, which is a license that is issued by HEMAC, a regulator, a self regulatory body, and the CSRC. So when client asks us about uh, how to apply a license, how to which license to apply, and the regulatory requirements for daily operation. It's not a, it's a, it can involve different uh, approaches and also complete analysis of all the, of, of different licenses, different regulators. Uh, that's why it's very important to have a bigger picture to understand how to consider the whole, whole market and the different uh, regulatory requirements. And uh, then for the next slide, we summarize the certain key factor to consider. The factors uh, to consider are summarized uh, based on our experience in advising all the different types of uh, asset managers on their entering the PRC market. We, we can quickly consider, uh, explain why they are important. The first factor, wealth management or asset management. This, uh, first of all, we understand that in many foreign jurisdictions, the term wealth management is totally different, has very different meaning from asset management. Here in China, it depends on the context. They can be different, but they can be quite similar. For example, if you can remember in the prior slide, we have wealth management subsidiaries, which are licensed granted by the CBIRC. With that license, although you can establish a wealth management company, it's, it's a business scope is actually quite similar to an asset manager. Still, in many uh, other term, uh, scenarios, a wealth management license means that you, you can introduce investors to other asset managers, not uh, manage your own assets. So, so that's the difference. If you are considering uh, which business, wealth management or asset management, you might need to consider the the correct, the, the, the accurate meaning and the PST law and the license to apply for. The next one is asset managed products or wealth uh, or private investment funds. So and the PRC law, asset managed products are supposed to be product issued by financial institutions, while private investment funds are funds issued by private fund managers who are not supposed to be uh, financial institutions. Still, private investment funds can, in essence, be quite similar to asset management products in terms of its regulatory requirements, and uh, the, 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 the investor they can approach and the, the investment instruments. So this is important because if you want to launch asset management products, you, you need to first become an asset manager, which should be a financial institution. In that case, the financial, all the complicated financial regulations applicable will apply to the entity you set up. The direct regulatory burden will be essentially higher than merely setting up a private fund manager. The next factor is whether to 
become an investment manager or investment advisor. Uh, again, in PRC, investment manager and investment advisor are quite different. Uh, we understand that in certain other jurisdiction, an investment advisor can actually make investment decisions for their clients. But here in China, if you are only an investment advisor, if you only have an investment advisory license, you do not make investment decision for your investors, for your clients, and neither do you raise funds from your investors. You only provide investment advice, uh, and uh, for most of the cases, our clients would prefer to become investment managers so that they can raise funds and also manage their own products. But this is, but still, uh, still certain investment manager can also become an investment advisor. That's that's a special scenario. For example, one of our client has applied their PFM license so that they can become so they can they can manage their own funds. But they also applied have obtained the investment advisor obligation. That means they can provide advice to other investment manager. So why do they do that? The, the, the answer is simple because as an investment manager, you need to raise funds from investors. Many foreign asset managers, when they first come into China, they do not have the capacity to raise large sums of funds. Uh, so it's easier for them to cooperate with the local asset managers who have their existing funds and then they can provide investment advice to the local asset managers and gradually they can build up their reputation and later they can uh, maybe raise more funds and manage their own products. Uh, and the, the following two factors, whether you want to apply for only one license, establish only one entity, I want to have multiple licenses or entities. The, for example, uh, again, for the PFM license, which allows you to launch your own onshore products. Many foreign asset managers, when they first come into China, again, they have the fundraising issue. They find it difficult to launch their own products. But if they also happen to have a QFA license, which is a license allows, which allows them to raise funds offshore, but invest in the PRC market, if they have both licenses, then they can invest their fund under their QFA license into the local product issued under their PFM license. So that's how sometimes if you have multiple licenses, you can uh, have a synergy between your different entities and uh, better have better chance of uh, succeeding in this market. And the last factor about the onshore license or, or less onshore or offshore license product, uh, very briefly, in China, you can raise fund locally and the invest in offshore market. But also you can raise from the offshore and the invest in the PRC market. That require different licenses. When you consider how to explore the chances in the PRC market, you might be considering raising fund in the onshore market, but you can also uh, be interested in only investing in this market with your offshore liquidity. So that's another con that that's another factor to consider. So these are the uh, major factors that people should should consider. But uh, uh, if you have any specific questions on um, how to enter this market, uh, we probably need to consider your sp your speciality and your specific circumstances. Uh, and uh, there are some other factors to consider, which we can separately discuss. Okay, uh, for the next slide, for the next slide, uh, slide 10, we have a picture showing, there are uh, a structure showing 
there can be onshore products, cross-border products, and offshore products. All depends on how you how you are considering uh, approaching the uh, uh, explore and transit in the PRC market. For example, we see that uh, you can have onshore products, but investing in offshore markets under the QDRI, QDLP, or QDIE licenses. On the other side, if you have offshore products, but you want to invest in the domestic PRC market, then you can consider the Q QFI or QFLP products or licenses. Uh, besides this, there are some other uh, avenues, cross-border avenue, under which you do not actually need to apply a license, but you can rather you can uh, register or file with certain regulator, then you can save the trouble of, of maintaining a license and complying with certain uh, complicated regulatory requirements on maintaining the licenses. For example, we have the Star Connect, which quite has been quite popular, but we also have some other cross-border investment avenues. For example, the Bond Connect, which allows foreign investors to, to have access to the huge China interbank market. And by the way, uh, recently the, the the PRC regulators are trying to uh, allow investors in the China interbank market to also invest in the China securities bond market. So we can see a growing need among the investors to ex to, ex to invest in different types of bond markets. And also we have the another investment avenue, which is the MRF, Mutual Recognized Fund, which allows offshore mutual funds to raise funds from local investors. So that's an uh, avenue for people to raise fund, not rather than investing in the PRC market. Uh, okay, so the next slide. For the next slide, uh, we, we can see a summary of the, who are the clients foreign investor can approach. Uh, uh, so people, uh, maybe people, we can briefly go through on the uh, this slide on, on the left on the for the left column we, we listed uh, certain types of asset managers, for example, mutual fund managers, bank wealth and managers, private secure fund managers, and all the different licenses will allow you to approach different types of investors. This is a summary for reference only because in practice, the, the detailed rules are more complicated than this. Uh, for example, here we have the mutual fund managers, which is, which might be the license that allow asset manager to have access to all the types of investors, including retail investors, high net worth individuals. But uh, that also means you, uh, but on the other side, but on the other hand, for mutual fund manager, the regulatory uh, cost could be much higher than uh, the, the burden for private security fund manager. So uh, on, on the third line, we see for the private security fund managers, uh, they can still raise funds from many types of investors, including mainly institutional investors, high net worth individuals, which many foreign uh, is the foreign asset manager have been quite interested in. If, but if they have, but they are, they, if they are interested in approaching, have, having access to retail investors, then they can convert their private secure fund manager to mutual fund managers. 
So if you can remember in you know, a prior slide, we briefly mentioned that there are already 32 private security fund managers, but excludes, but uh, that number 22 ex does not include uh, the largest private security fund manager. Certain private security fund managers have already deregistered de because they have applied for the mutual fund manager. Uh, so, so uh, in that case, if people are considering which license they want to consider, this is another, uh, this is another strategy. If you have not determined whether you want to uh, establish a financial institution like mutual fund management company, you might consider whether you want to first apply for private security fund management license, which you can convert to a mutual fund manager at a later stage, depending on the market circumstances. Okay, for the next part, part three, we can briefly talk about FinTech regulation. For FinTech regulation, um, Actually, the questions uh, that our, our clients ask about FinTech regulation are still mainly from for uh, institutions who have FinTech uh, issues. Uh, and uh, for, so for the next slide, if we can look at the next slide, we can see that uh, for the, and the PLC law, actually there is not a, uh, a very, very strict uh, regu uh, definition of fintech, and uh, neither do the uh, neither is there a specialized regulator for fintech regulation. Rather, the various regulators, so we see here, including mainly PBOC, which is the central bank, CBIRC, the, the banking insurance regulator, and CSRC, which is uh, security regulator. They have been regulating the application of FinTech by the inst fin financial institution under their supervision rather than regulating specialized FinTech companies. For example, we can see here uh, CBIRC, they can regulate online lending and the insurance, internet insurance by banks and insurance companies, and also uh, the banks and the insurance company, they might outsource FinTech to third party FinTech companies. Because the regulatory framework under PRC law, CBIRC might not be, mm -hmm. might not uh, exactly have the authority to regulate the third party service providers, but the CBIRC does have the power to regulate uh, the banks and insurance companies in terms of their outsourcing to the third party FinTech service providers. So that's how FinTech regulation uh, works in overall and the PRC law. And for the next slide, we can have one example, which is how FinTech uh, is, has been regulated in respect of investment management. Uh, we have three examples here. First is investment advisory service. We, we briefly mentioned in a prior slide, slide that uh, certain foreign asset managers have been trying to provide investment advisory services after obtaining their investment management or advisory license. And this is um, a market where uh, some of our clients have been considering to to enter into because they have the technology advantage. They can make use of AI, uh, big data, or cloud uh, calculation. And uh, by making use of this technology, they can provide uh, investment advice to local investors. Uh, 
when there is when there is the market development is for example there is a joint venture between on the group uh, which is the fintech company under alibaba the, the and uh, another shareholder of this joint venture is the one god so they set up a joint venture to provide you might fund investment advisory business by making use of ai and this a second example is quant trading uh, quant trading is kind of a very hot topic uh, in the PLC market. Many uh, foreign asset managers are trying to explore chances in this field, but uh, because the PLC market regulators are quite uh, concerned about uh, making use of quant trading and uh, high frequency trading, especially in respect to uh, uh, future and security trading. So this is a field that uh, the regulations are quite uh, complicated and uh, also regulators are paying uh, attention to uh, issues like, for example, market manipulation. Uh, if people are familiar with this field, uh, you may remember that in 2015, some certain famous foreign quant trading firms have been penalized due to their violation of PRC laws. The last example is about the uh, cross-border trading platforms and tools. For example, we, we know that uh, the asset managers in offshore jurisdictions are more familiar with their own trading platforms such as, uh, such as Bloomberg and uh, TradeWeb. And, uh, and, the, and the PRC regulators fully understand this and they, are, they have issued certain policies or, or frameworks under which uh, foreign asset managers can still use their own, their familiar uh, trading platforms or tools. Okay, this is all for FinTech and uh, for the, for part four, we can talk about certain ongoing concerns and trends which people might be interested in, particularly after they have obtained their license uh, under PRC law. But still, before applying for the licenses, we can briefly consider, we can uh, first have, uh, first consider the major aspects or ongoing concerns. For example, uh, here we can see uh, the selection location, the regulated approval, and uh, choosing custodian brokers and distributors. These are the main major three steps that uh, we suggest our clients to consider from time to time when they, after they have considered, uh, determined which license they want to apply. This is important because, for example, for the selection location, uh, this uh, the major financial center in China, Beijing, Shenzhen, and uh, Shanghai. They have they are different uh, in terms of the industries, talents, but also in terms of the specific regulatory requirements. For example, uh, one of the lessons we briefly mentioned, uh, QDR, QDLP. Uh, in Shanghai, there are already many QDLP companies and which they can raise funds in, in, uh, locally and invest in offshore markets. But still, you can also consider other uh, financial centers, for example, in Shenzhen. If you have already have uh, many uh, fund management license in Hong Kong, and then you can explore transit in Shenzhen because uh, of the because it's close to Shenzhen, also Shenzhen has been quite, has issued many regulations to attract asset managers, particularly from Hong Kong. Then, uh, then after, uh, after obtaining the approval, uh, the, the next step is you need to enter into agreements with custodians, brokers, and distributors will provide uh, services for you to, to raise funds, 
to open secure trading uh, accounts. Based on our experience, many foreign asset managers are uh, still uh, uh, still tend to cooperate with foreign invested custodian brokers because this might involve different. Uh, uh, this might involve uh, entering into service agreements and uh, for the foreign investment custodians brokers they might uh, have uh, templates which the foreign asset managers are familiar with but for distributors we can see that uh, the local banks and security firms have been more have been more attracting to the foreign asset managers. Okay, so and as the next slide, we can see some more examples of specific uh, ongoing concerns and trends. The first uh, one is actual territorial jurisdiction. The this this issue is important uh, mainly in two in two ways. First, uh, still many foreign asset managers have not determined to enter the PRC market. For example, they might uh, uh, raise funds from PRC investors, but with their offshore liquidity, because many rich people in China, they do have offshore liquidity. So without uh, applying for license and entering the PRC market, certain foreign asset managers have been raising funds from the PRC investors and uh, manage their products offshore. So from time to time, we have clients approaching us to ask questions about uh, cross-border fundraising activities and why the PRC law uh, restriction might be triggered. And, uh, and But st still, we, we see that uh, many foreign asset managers have already entered this market, they are still concerned about actual territorial jurisdiction uh, because they're, they also they manage assets both in China and uh, uh, outside China. Certain, sometimes uh, uh, cross-border issues might arise, such as their uh, investment positions. They might hold uh, investment positions, positions in securities or futures, both in the PRC market, in other markets such as Hong Kong or Singapore. And if you may re recall, we mentioned that they could have a QV license or some other license official, offshore, which allows them to invest in the PRC markets. And then after they apply for local license, for example, a mutual fund license or PFM license, then their local products can also uh, invest in, in the domestic market. Then that uh, triggers complicated rules on calculation of their positions. And also there are concerns about uh, market, uh, such as market uh, manipulation. This is why extra territorial jurisdiction issues have been becoming uh, a big major concern to many multi-jurisdiction asset managers. And then for the daily operations, the asset managers are concerned about uh, employment and uh, their power and respons responsibilities over their senior management personnel. Uh, for, for questions like this, we, we do have a sophisticated labor law team but uh, for our clients who are asset managers, these questions are actually uh, the, most of the liberal lawyers are not quite familiar with these issues. So uh, this is why for most of our clients, when they are considering general corporate issues like employment, and also here we have the, another example, data protection, uh, they still need to uh, ask for advice from us rather than from other law firms who might have a stronger employment or data protection practice. 
uh, and other key issues, including security and trading, uh, security and future trading rules, which we uh, briefly mentioned when we talk about the extraterritorial jurisdiction, and also uh, internal governance, risk control, all these detailed uh, issues uh, may be considered at an earlier stage when people are considering which license to apply for, because the regulatory burdens in China might not be uh, might, might might be considerable if for newcomers. So this is why it's important, as we mentioned earlier, if people have not determined which license to apply for and uh, the, the potential regulatory uh, impact on their offshore practice, they might consider, for example, applying for uh, certain cross-border investment uh, uh, qualification or before they apply for financial institution license, they might consider whether they uh, may first uh, uh, apply for private fund management license to test water. Okay, these are the most of the major topics we should address today. For the last part, part five, we provide some brief introduction to our law firm, Fonda Partners. Uh, we guys, we can just uh, quickly uh, go through and uh, we are a law firm specializing uh, in both corporate law and uh, the dispute res resolution. We have offices in all the major cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou. And for our team, we specialize in the asset management and uh, related uh, financial regulatory issues. Uh, and uh, for the next slide, we will list the certain recent awards, market rankings we have obtained, just for your reference. Okay, and uh, yes, market recognition from Chambers League of 500, just, uh, we can just quickly browse this for reference. And the next slide is also a recent market recognition in the past two or three years. So we do have a strong practice in many different uh, fields. So this makes us uh, capable of providing comprehensive advice to financial institutions who have Legal service demand in various aspects, including what's on banking, finance, capital market. Okay, and uh, at last, uh, just uh, some brief introduction to G, my partner here. So, G is the leader in this field, uh, not only in our firm, but also in the whole market, we have been, uh, at least we consider we are the market leader in this market. And this is a slide about me, where I have also been working in the financial record field in the past around 10 years. Okay, so thanks to everyone. Uh, and uh, feel free to let us know if you have any follow-up questions. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blake. And, and just before we move to the Q&A, I wanted to say a big thank you to you for your insights today, an incredibly fascinating and, and important webinar, um, I believe. So thank you very much for joining us um, to our audience. If you have a question for Blake or Z at the moment, please do send it in. Um, Blake, we have a few questions. I think that we may be able to finish a little bit ahead of time. Um, 
unless we get any more questions in from the audience. But um, our first question is, what are the benefits of setting up a separate research team when establishing a new licensed entity in China? Oh, thanks, Dan. Actually, this is a question that uh, uh, certain other certain clients have been considering. Uh, for the research license, uh, for the research team uh, or our clients, they might uh, actually some of them actually first uh, establish have their own research team on show before they have a regular license. Uh, this is because for general research license or general research, research team, they do not exactly to have a financial license for that. They, it can be a general consulting woofy, a general consulting company, so that before they uh, actually apply for the license, they can first learn about the market and uh, approach local regulators to to understand the regulatory framework this is why before they have the asset management license they can first have a research team it's not exactly a research license it will be a licensing requirement if you provide the research reports or research services to other asset managers so that's how it works uh, and uh, we mentioned a bit earlier that uh, some ISN managers, they, after they have their ISN management license, they might further consider providing advisory services or research services to other ISN managers. And that's another scenario where they, they, they make use of their research uh, capability to manage more to, to provide a web to to serve it, to serve other asset managers but if you are only concerning uh providing research service to your own offshore team or to or in the future to your local asset management com company you can first simply set up a research woofy which do not have to be licensed Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Blake. And the second question that we've had in, um, just asked if you can speak about some of the risks arising from the increasing use of online data storage and, and data transfer. Yeah, sure. Uh, about this, uh, first of all, it's true that uh, we have many clients who are considering uh how whether they can uh transfer their clients data or some other data such as market data offshore or on the other hand or which data they can transfer from offshore or, and also other regulatory requirements such as or when they obtain data from onshore service providers how should they comply with local requirements on data securities and uh, individual data protection. Um, we believe the currently a major concern is the regulatory requirements are not crystal clear. It has been a quickly evolving field in the past two or three years. And uh, we can see that the, the, the specific requirements have been evolving very quickly. That's a uh, concern to our clients who, who need to make use of a large amount of data to, based on which they provide their investment uh, asset management uh, advice. Uh, and also many foreign asset managers have been more familiar with their offshore uh, data service providers, which can uh, risk which can trigger another issue is whether the offshore service providers are licensed in China. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Blake. Um, they're, they're the questions that we've had in from the audience so far. I know that we, we've had a few questions in beforehand, but what I will do is send those on to Blake and Z and the team, and they'll be able to respond to those in time, because I think that some of those are of a more personal matter. Um, 
But Blake, Z, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, a thoroughly interesting and, as I say, an incredibly important topic. So thank you very much for delivering that to our audience. Thank you very much to our audience as well for being with us today. We really appreciate it. We've had a great audience in today and also on LinkedIn as well. So, um, Blake, I'll hand back to you to close today's webinar. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, 